Natalie with Primary Focus. I am so excited to connect with you, to connect my audience to you, and talk everything YouTube and education, girlfriend. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. I love talking about YouTube, so this is the perfect place for me. <laughs> I thought it was so funny when I asked you to speak about YouTube, you were like, yes, you were so excited to talk about YouTube because you're not technically like a YouTube educator. You're not a YouTube teacher. So tell everybody your business and what it is that you do. Yeah. Um, so my name's Natalie Parmenter. I'm the founder of Primary Focus, the parent's guide to elementary school. Um, I was an elementary school teacher for 10 years. I left teaching two years ago, almost exactly two years ago now, to start my business. I work directly with parents to help kind of solve those mysteries of the classroom. I felt like when I was teaching, um, there's this disconnect between teachers and parents. And really, parents are the most important people to be talking to. Uh, but I was always so rushed. Parent-teacher conferences were short. And I just felt like if parents could know some of the information that I was learning in college and I was practicing day to day in the classroom, they could support their kids so much more. So that's how Primary Focus was born. It's a YouTube channel. Um, I have a newsletter as well that comes out every week with advice uh, from the perspective of a teacher. Um, and then I work one on one with families as well. And probably the most exciting thing is this summer, I have a course coming out this June um, about preparing your child for kindergarten. I've teamed up with Johns Hopkins to present it, actually. So if you've got a kiddo starting kindergarten in the next two years, even this fall, this is the class for you to figure out how to help your kids in school. I love that so much. Why do you think, I, I'm curious because I don't have children. I have lots of children in my life, just none of my own. But why would a parent, this is curiosity for me, why would a parent need to prep for kindergarten? Mm. Like that, oh. I know when I went to kindergarten, there probably wasn't any sort of prep. It was like, you're five, good luck. Yeah, so you know, us, early- Why they need that. Early childhood education is so important, but it's really hard to access, especially in the United States. There's a huge disc. I'm sure you've heard your friends talk about how hard it is to even get into a daycare, let alone a preschool, and the costs are really prohibitive. Um, so there are a lot of people who want to support their child because if you have a strong start in kindergarten, this is the first real year of your education. If a child is a little bit behind in kindergarten, that gap is so small. It's really easy to go in, fill in the blanks, fix up anything that they're lacking. But if we don't attack these things in kindergarten, first, even second grade, by the time a child gets into upper elementary school, those gaps are enormous. And it's just so hard to run backwards while they're simultaneously running forward and learning new things. Um, so the more we can prepare our children for school at the ages of like three and four, the better year they'll have in kindergarten and then the better start to their education that they'll have. That's is something is never thought of, you know, not being a parent. I would have never thought about that. So I know we could stay on here and talk about education all day long. And I do want to ask you one more personal question before we hop into YouTube. But I saw in your bio too, you lived in Vietnam for two years. Please tell me about that. That is so interesting. Yeah. So I lived in Vietnam for two years. I taught at an international school there. I, I love different cultures. I love traveling. I've always been so curious about the other ways that people live and how other countries are doing things, you know, completely different than us, um, but are also just moving along, living wonderful lives too. Um, that's just always, that's the thing that I can fixate on forever. So living abroad was a goal of mine. And I had the opportunity to teach in Hanoi, Vietnam at an international school for two years. So I did that. Um, I was in a long distance relationship for two years while I did it. We are married now. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for that's sticking amazing. with it that whole time. <laughs> yeah, but I lived abroad it, and it changed a lot of the ways that my perspective just on my own personal life is and then also my teaching style um, as well because I really saw that like there we can teach kids in so many different ways and we can really push them to be curious and let their curiosity lead the learning instead of letting necessarily curriculum lead the learning so I, I've really kind of understood about like how to meet students where they're at how to meet people where they at, are 
where people are in general, um, because if people are interested in things, they're naturally going to go farther down the road of learning about it than they would about something boring that you put in front of them. So just an incredible experience. I just went back this October um, for the first time. I think it had been six years. I wanted to go back sooner, but uh, 2020 got in the way. And I went back and saw my old students and they're all in middle school, eighth and ninth grade, getting ready to start high school now. And oh, it was amazing to see them grown up. They all remembered me too. That's so sweet. I'm sure you made such an impact on them. And I love what you said about leading with curiosity because I grew up thinking I was a bad student. Like I really struggled Mm. in school as a student. And it wasn't until college when I was taking marketing classes and public relations classes that I was like, Ooh, I like studying this. And so, um, and made A's and good grades, which was great for my confidence. But it's just funny that you said that because you know, my confidence in school was never good because I did not like history and my dad was a history major. So he did not understand why I was oh just boy. Like, I don't like it, you know, so funny. All right. We could talk about that for hours, but I wanted to ask you with all the social media platforms out there, I mean, there's <clears throat> TikTok, Snapchat, Pinterest, uh, YouTube, Instagram, like all of the things, Facebook, Tell me, when you quit teaching and you were starting Primary Focus, when did you realize that YouTube was going to be your main platform? Yeah. So there was research that went into this because I knew I wanted to, I wanted to make something accessible. I naturally am pretty pretty good at writing. Like if I wanted to make this whole thing a blog, I could have. But one thing that I know is a lot of people, they're not going to sit down and read and think about how many blogs you've looked at where you just kind of scroll and look at the pictures, maybe read the intro, but you're not, you're, you're not reading the whole thing unless you're truly interested. Um, and a lot of people, you know, frankly, aren't great readers or English is not their first language. And one of the goals for me is equity. And I think presenting over video where I can make a video, edit it to say exactly what I wanted to say, have captions be automatically generated. Um, and be able to do it in a longer period of time um, was really important to me. Long period of time is important here because a lot of our platforms, they're trying to do bite-sized pieces. And, you know, everybody loves a 30-second video of a cat being adorable. But, you know, it's it's not going to teach you anything about cats. It's just going to give you, like, one little adage about it, one little out-of-context piece of information. And when you're working in the world of education, you need more than that. There's so much context that is important. So I moved to YouTube. The other reason why is YouTube is an incredible library. That's how I see it. It's it's a it's like the Library of Congress. It's filled with videos on everything from, you know, tutorials to actual teachers that are teaching different subjects online to just pure entertainment. This is for fun. Um, But I wanted to put myself in that library and make videos that people can watch again and again. The next time you go on YouTube, I want you to try and start looking at the dates and realize how old the videos that you're watching are. A lot of videos that are still trending. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are like 5, 10, 15 years old at this point, and they're still valuable. They're still important. And I love that because right now, um, the way short form video is on other platforms, it feels like it's relevant for 48 hours and that's it, you know? Right. It is. It, it, you're right about that. I mean, it can still get discovered, but uh, Pinterest and YouTube are the best for that long-term searchability. And because I watch a lot of videos on marketing, digital marketing, I uh, specifically look at the years because I don't want something from three years ago because things have changed so much. So I am the type of education I'm educating myself on on YouTube does need to be very time specific. And yeah. relevant, but it's funny because you're right. I have a video from four years ago that I posted that I still make affiliate money on. There you go. I yeah. Promote it anywhere, but it's just really good extra income from that one video that four years ago I took time to make that I am still making a monthly paycheck from. Yeah. And I like some of my more popular videos are really not really old, but like they're old at this point. They're years old. Like the I think like the fifth video I ever made continues to be one of my top performing videos every month, which is just incredible because I could probably barely barely tell you what's on that video anymore because it's so far out of my mind. But I know that it's still relevant. It makes sense. And it's it's a skill that parents need. Um, A couple other things about YouTube here. I just want to drop some stats for you. Um, YouTube. Um, 50% of people watching YouTube are watching YouTube on their television. 
I'm not talking about YouTube TV where they've made like the kind of cable service. I'm talking about they go to YouTube.com or they have the YouTube app on their television and they're just tuning in from their TV. Um, so there is a real space here. You've noticed, yeah, like a lot of videos are getting really long, 20, 30 minutes. And, you know, for me, if I'm sometimes that can be annoying when a video is that long, but a lot of people are sitting down and they're cooking dinner or they're eating dinner in front of the television. Um, and in fact, uh, I learned this stat the other day, YouTube has more viewers watching during prime time hours. So that kind of like what, six to 10 PM block mm -hmm. than the top 10 TV shows combined. I heard so that, if that the other day and I'm not surprised because I am that consumer that is sitting down on my couch, maybe after dinner with my computer to just like wrap up some emails or check some work. And I don't want to get uh, like watching a series or a show or something like that, but I will put YouTube on, on my TV, on the background yeah. to just kind of educate myself, learn something, because I feel like even if I'm not really paying attention, I'm hearing and consuming things. And I think I heard, I heard that same statistic the other day, and I heard that it is we're just starting because right now I think people, I think this is important for everybody to hear. If, if you don't even have a YouTube channel yet, you're not behind because it, these trends are just now starting and they're only going to go up. This younger generation that is watching YouTube instead of television, that is the trend. And yeah. so you're not behind, go ahead and start because then you, if you wait five years from now, you will be left behind. You will be so happy if you just start, even if you're posting like once a month, correct? Yeah, just just get started. And something, I think just to jump off that point, if you start to ask children in your life what their favorite TV show is, a lot of times they'll tell you, I don't watch TV, but I love these YouTubers. Um, and that's, and I was experiencing this when I was teaching kindergarten, break the ice, beginning of the year, chit chat. What's your favorite TV show? They're all like, you know, Ms. Rachel or, you know, the, all, all sorts of channels that I don't watch, uh, right. <laughs> but right. it, it's incredible to see like this force and it's, it's just people at home doing their thing. Of course, you can make it as professional as you want it to, um, but it doesn't have to be like, it can just start with you and your phone in a quiet room. Are you uploading some footage that's relevant to what you're talking about? Um, and as we kind of dive into things today, um, I think some of it, if you're starting from square one right now, it might feel really overwhelming. Um, but I want you to know this is something that you can build on in steps and get better over time. And you can, you don't have to start at the top, right? Like your, your aspiration should not be Mr. Beast who has a team of people around him and essentially is operating out of like a Hollywood style studio type right. situation. Find somebody else that's maybe in your niche or somebody that like, maybe they're not in your niche, but you admire them and kind of go and look at their library, look at their oldest videos compared to now, you can go on primary focus. I very intentionally keep my old stuff up and you can watch me from my crappy little iPhone with a terrible echo in my living room into where I am now with like a much nicer microphone. I am staring at a wall of foam panels right now. I've got a nice little set behind me, but like the other side of the room is foam panels and I have lights in here, but that's been years on YouTube of deciding to invest in this over time. Mm -hmm. So give yourself space and patience and time to even see, you know, what kind of world you want to carve out for yourself on YouTube first. Yes. I love that you said that because I tell everybody just start and then you'll figure it mm. out. It's kind of like exercising. You just have to start somewhere. And right now, I mean, YouTube is a goal of mine in 2024, 2025. But right now, if you're watching this on YouTube, because it will be posted, I just have my AirPods in. I don't have the lights, you know, and I give myself grace because right now my only primary focus, pun intended, is to uh, just get some videos up, to get the content up, yes. to try to get my podcast in video format and yes. just on the podcast platform because I'm podcasting, I'm interviewing anyway, so I might as well just do it in video format. So on that note too, are there any software tools or AI tools that you're using to help? with YouTube that you might find beneficial. Yes, absolutely. Um, and again, you'll have to walk with me here because there's there's levels to this. Um, so I would say start where you're comfortable with, get used to a few things, and then maybe every couple of months challenge yourself to change one thing in the video. Because a lot of this is just getting used to things, building up your tolerance. I know you're probably adding this on to your already full schedule. 
Um, but the very basics, you're going to want to have you know, youtube.com and the YouTube app on your phone and then YouTube studio, which is studio.youtube.com. And the studio is the back end where you'll do your uploading. You can see all your analytics, all of those things. You can get the app on your phone, but on the desktop, it is incredible the amount of analytics that they give you. I mean, they put Instagram, TikTok, Facebook to absolute shame. Like I feel like I'm running a corporation when I look at my analytics. Um, and it's also pretty easy to read, which is nice too. It is not like you'll if you really want to spend an afternoon you can but uh like it's easy to see and it's exciting to see your growth um you want to start with a quiet filming space and try your best to get rid of the echo a good microphone can help there um i mean you don't have to have the 800 dollar wonderful microphone and stuff like that like you can go online and find stuff that's pretty good play around with the settings um but a quiet space is really important too camera and tripod if you're starting with your cell phone do not put it in selfie mode and stare at yourself. The camera on the back of your phone is much higher quality um, and get a little tripod to set it up or like a coffee mug for it to lean on, just something where it can be stable. Um, and what I would recommend, I know it's really hard because you want to know that you're in frame in the camera. A lot of, um, a lot of people will set up and put like a little mirror behind them or something reflective where they can at least, you know, check in from time to time and make sure that they're still in frame. What I would say is people will forgive poor visuals, um, but they won't forgive poor sound. So if you're going to, if you need to invest, if you want to go buy your first piece of equipment, I would invest in microphone over camera if you're trying to, you know, just be budget mindful. In terms of editing and things like that, I started on iMovie on my Mac. I started real simple. Um, and I know there are some people that have been on YouTube, are successful for years and still use iMovie. Um, and so start off with your basic editor if you don't know what you're doing because then you won't be overwhelmed and then just start searching tutorials like every time i was editing i used to be like okay how do i put a title or a graphic in and just would have a video side by side with me um as i edited canva is a great resource that's where i make like all of my um my graphics and things like that um and they even have a setting like the youtube size like everything that i make i put in the youtube thumbnail size so i can kind of understand. I use DaVinci personally to edit with. DaVinci is great. I love it. It's advanced. I was really frustrated the first six months I used DaVinci. Now I really love it. So I think you have to kind of understand. I would say the same thing about Adobe Premiere. Like those are next step up with a learning curve. Um, mm -hmm. My favorite favorite of all is Descript. Descript, oh my gosh, it's amazing because your sound quality will improve. They have a feature called a studio sound and it will take any background noise and just get rid of it all that white noise if the landscapers are going by as you're doing your video you can kind of get all that out it also transcribes what you say they have a free trial so you, i think it's 10 hours of transcribing that you get for free which like if you're making 10 minute videos is a lot of transcribing and it basically like it'll show the video side by side with essentially like a word document and you just edit it like an essay so like if i took three takes of me saying you know hello it's natalie welcome to primary focus and i realized i found my favorite one already i can just droop, highlight and delete the rest don't have to listen to them don't have to figure out where i started and stopped and took the breath it's just there so descript is probably my favorite um to edit with and if you are a podcast you might already know about it um but it, it started as podcasting software and they've moved into video editing as well. Um, I know that's, I, that's a lot. I love, love, love Descript. I will put my affiliate code in this YouTube video. Yes, <laughs> so, use it, you guys. It's so I good. It's so good. I, one of my girlfriends who is a coach, she sent me <clears> one of her videos one time. She tends to say so and like a lot. <laughs> And we were able to shave down over four minutes of her video. Stop just by it. Replacing <laughs> the filler words. I was like, do you realize you had four minutes of filler words? And it just made me laugh. But I do love Descript. I had a little bit of a learning curve with Descript as well, but I've kind of grown with it now. But they have a great tutorial on YouTube as well on how to use yeah. it. And that's the thing. It's it's using YouTube to learn. I think YouTube University is a real thing. And I learn every day, but I do think it's knowing what to search, knowing, uh, you know, that you're not watching an old video if it shouldn't be an old video and stuff like that. Tell me, yeah. do you use 
Um, what do you use? Do you use Descript or another software tool to repurpose content to Instagram, Facebook, or are you creating other content? Oh, that's a good question. So I'm a big fan of YouTube shorts as well. So I know I've been focusing in on long form. Sorry, there are landscapers outside my window. Can you hear those? I don't are they... hear them. No. Okay, good. <laughs> it's like always, I thought they already came this week. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're um, good. You're good. Yeah. So that that's a great question. I make a lot of short form content. So I'm on YouTube, making YouTube shorts, which you absolutely should be doing. We can get into that later. Yeah. Um, but I have an Instagram as well. Um, I have a TikTok. TikTok has not really popped off for me, but like I just throw some stuff up there sometimes. <laughs> um, and so I do a mix. I make videos, um, you know, where I'm just talking to the camera or, you know, kind of cute trending content, things like that, separate from the long form. But I will take clips of my long form videos and repurpose them. Typically what I do, I know a lot of people love CapCut and things like that. Um, I just go into my video editor, editor in DaVinci. You can repurpose um, your horizontal video to be vertical. And I just kind of mess in the settings and I'll, I'll um, take out like a 20 second clip from that and upload from there. So not that fancy. You'll find what works. The one thing that I'll say is if you're repurposing videos, you want to try and give yourself a wide angle to start with. Like you can always zoom in on yourself when you're editing, but if you start with a wider crop, you won't end up with that crazy pixelated. You know how sometimes people upload and it's like, I did not need to know your nose that personally. Right, um, right. So the wider you start, if you plan to repurpose down the line, um, the the higher quality it'll look as you zoom into to this frame. Yes, I agree. I tell people that all the time. So this one probably wouldn't be. But also on my hair today. Look, <laughs> if you are watching this video, I'm at the beach in my swimsuit. About to go hit the sand. So I'm excited. Um, I think nowadays it used to be more important for vertical video. But what we're seeing in the social media world is that landscape video is trending just as much right now on TikTok and Instagram so people care less and it can stop the scroll because it looks a little bit different. So I, I'm telling people just give up the perfection and trying to make everything right and just do. We're in such a scrolling society. So it is more about the hooks and the value that you bring. And that's why I wanted yeah. to have you talk about this too because I really wanted somebody who wasn't a YouTube creator like a YouTube editor hmm. teaching this because you have seen success on YouTube and have truly, I think, become a YouTube influencer because that's where you pop up in my feed a lot. Like when I see you, it's it's not typically on Instagram. And, and for those who don't know, Natalie and I know each other through a networking group that we're in together in Charlotte. Um, so we do follow each other on all the platforms, but every time I log on to YouTube, you're popping up. So I love that because that shows me that's where you're putting the attention. And I think that's important. And that's why I wanted you to come talk about YouTube because I think there's so much noise out there from educators and coaches in the social media world. And anytime I do a training, I really want to be upfront when I don't know something as well. Now, granted, I've played around with YouTube for years. I feel like I could be confident on YouTube. And that's why it's a goal of mine, but that's why I really wanted you to come speak on it as well. Absolutely. So thank, you, thank you so much. What advice would you give somebody right now who's probably watching who goes, I feel sick to my stomach to show up on YouTube, but I know yeah. that I need it for my business. What would you say to them? Well, first, I would remind you how useful it is, right? If somebody ever sends you a TikTok video and you don't have TikTok on your phone, they're not going to watch it. YouTube is so accessible. People go, people watch for hours. They're not even logged in, you know? So just remember, and you can repurpose this, put this on your website, like a, the power of a YouTube video. It's so, you can repurpose it in so many places. So just remember, like, this is truly something that will continue to give back to you in a different way than the hamster wheel of Instagram and TikTok. So just, just remember, like, it's a long game, but that also means like, because it's a long game, even though it's going to be hard work, like you can do this once a month, you can do this twice, twice, three times a month. I do think at first you should do it a little bit more so that you get used to it. And I would say embrace the cringe, 
people love cringe on YouTube and they are rooting for you. It is so like, I remember, especially in my early days when I was getting started, people would leave these comments on my, on my videos and they'd be like, great video, great content. I learned a lot. Your sound quality could be improved. Can't wait to watch more videos. And I'm like, okay, I didn't know myself, you know, but it's, I look back on that and I'm like, they loved it. They could see the purpose. They could see what I'm doing. People have energy and time and understanding for you to talk a little longer on YouTube. They're excited to watch your growth. So you have to kind of get out of your own way when it comes to things like this. Just post, just do it. I know that we are our own worst enemies. We are the people that can be the rudest to ourselves. The way I talk to myself in my mind sometimes, I would slap someone across the face if they talk to me like that, you know? And sometimes I have to just grab myself, you know, and say like, hey, Natalie, nobody's saying that to you right now. Nobody has said that. And so it's not real. Like that's just your mind making a scenario. So you got to kind of get out of your way. Um, and what I what I would do is just treat it like a process. Don't try to do this all in one day. It is overwhelming at first, especially if you're starting from zero. So take 45 minutes, plan out kind of your script. I would recommend bullet pointing over a full on word for word script, something that you can talk about. Your first videos, keep them under 10 minutes. Five to 10 minutes is great. Do not load yourself down with a 45 minute planned video lecture. First of all, that can probably be six or seven videos if you chop it up, but also you're never gonna finish that. It's just too much to bite off. So just start small, maybe give yourself two weeks start to finish. Spend a day, figure out you know what software that you need to download, make your account, do a little research, then plan your video, then Put on, you know, your nice shirt if you want to, you know, if you do a little makeup, do your filming day, let it rest for a day, then come back, edit one day, edit day two, edit day three, and then upload and just give yourself time. It is not like uploading a reel onto Instagram where you can do it in an hour. Like this is a project and, and treat it like that and you'll have a lot less frustration. You're still going to have frustration, but <laughs> let, let that be what feels cringe and not your own self. I love that. So that is such valuable advice, even for myself, somebody who does feel comfortable on camera and being on YouTube, just not doing it, but that, hey, it's not going to be as fast as Instagram mm. real. It's it's not going to be as fast. And for somebody who can be impatient about things, I think that's why I haven't really uh, dove in to YouTube as much because it, it, it is a process and it takes time, but the value in it is worth the time, the ROI. Yes. For sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Natalie, I am so glad um, that you did this today and you are going to be teaching in our membership. I am so excited next Tuesday. So not this coming Tuesday, but the next Tuesday in our socially growing membership. Uh, you guys, if you're not familiar with the membership, it's where we teach all things social media. It's where you get to come in and ask live Q&As. We show you examples. We show you and walk you through different steps. So Natalie would love for you to show us like that YouTube studio, maybe how you upload a video. Show us DaVinci. Show us your screen and just give us those inside bits and pieces that we would love to see. What I love about the membership over YouTube is that people are just live there watching and asking questions and we get to have you as a resource because you're now our YouTube expert in the group. So we will get you in there. The link to the membership if you want to join is going to be right below this video. Natalie, I am going to end with a couple of rapid fire questions for you just to get to know you a little bit better and love it. So one, because I'm at the beach, are you more of a beach girl or a mountain girl? Oh, I'm a beach girl all the way. I love the beach. Awesome. Do you tend to watch YouTube more or Netflix more? You know what? I'm a bad example. I watch way more Netflix than I do YouTube. That's funny. No, I probably just consume way too much. And because you like to travel, world traveler, where would be your bucket list destination if I were to give you money to go anywhere tomorrow? My gosh, that's such a tough question because I have so many things um, on my bucket list. You know, I think I'd like to go 
Ooh, you're stumping me. <laughs> There's so many great places in this world. I would really love to do like a proper South American trip. I've I've been to Ecuador once and I've learned so many things about the countries in South America. So I would love you. Why don't you pay for me to take a little uh, little lap around South America? <laughs> you know, I wish I had those funds coming in. Maybe after I start my YouTube. <laughs> Perfect. Well. Yeah, y'all just start liking this video now because we could. Uh, Stetson needs to pay for my trip. Yeah, South, <laughs> South America, let's go. I'll come with you. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, Natalie. Thank you so much. And I will see you in a few weeks in the membership. I can't wait. See you then.